You know, when uh, Jeff said, take out that Connect card, you probably noticed there's another card that actually says Connect in your program. It's not that card um, that he was asking about, but this one is because for these four weeks, we're in this series that's called Be a, a, a Little Bit Salty, about being a little bit salty. And last week, we encouraged you to begin to pray for those people who are your neighbors to walk through your neighborhood, to pray for the people who live in the homes around you. Sandy and I have a dog that we walk in the morning and the evening, so it's a great time for us to pray for our neighbors. And it was really amazing because last week, there were four connections with neighbors that, I mean, we don't have that many connections usually in a week, in which we could you know, talk together. We got invited over to a neighbor's house. And so what begins happening when you start praying for those people who are around you? This week, has the purpose of connect. So, you know, say hello to your neighbor. Get a name. If you don't know the names of your neighbors, uh, say hello to that person who serves you if you're out to eat. Introduce yourself to that person that you're around. Begin to make those connections. So over these four weeks, we're building that, on that in preparation to connect for Explore God, as Jeff was talking about. Okay, I'm going to read the second part of this story sort of the end of this episode that Peggy began reading uh, or telling us, and then I'll do my best to try and explain what's happening in that moment. So then, this is Paul saying, King, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, and then those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the nations, all the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable, and the king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Let's pray together. Father, we're really living in, it's like an incendiary time in which to speak of our faith seems, Lord, it seems not permitted. It, it seems like it's taboo, like it's encroaching on somebody else's world or life, and we're just not allowed to do that. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll teach us what it means to be a people who have been redeemed by Jesus and have give, been given a story because we've lived it ourselves. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's really what I found to be true, that people will respond if we're vulnerable, if they hear something coming from vulnerable honesty. My, my favorite sermon preached in 2019, I love to listen to messages, it wasn't by a pastor or, or somebody like that. It was actually by a journalist a pretty well-known journalist who was the chief speechwriter, here he is, Michael Gerson is his name, chief speechwriter for one of our U.S. presidents. He publishes a weekly op-ed in the Washington Post and, and also has a talk a show on PBS. I mean, he's an extraordinary guy, really bright guy. So imagine this lay guy, not a pastor, being asked to preach. 
and then really sort of surprising everybody. This is what he said. He said, like nearly, um, nearly one in 10 Americans, and like many of you, I live with this insidious chronic disease. Depression is a malfunction in the instrument we use to determine reality. And so here was a man in a very public stage, the National Cathedral, revealing honesty, honestly what he struggles with, the darkest chapters of his life. He said, over time, despair can grow inside you like a tumor. At the bottom of my recent depression, I did a plus and minus, a pro and con of me, of being myself. The plus side, as you'd imagine, was short. The minus side included the most frightful cliches. You were a burden to your friends. You have no future. No one would miss you. And the scary thing is that these things felt completely true when I wrote them. Gerson took a few moments to explain that if people struggle like he does, and by the way, he was institutionalized for a short time last year with this depression, he said, you really need to seek help. And I, I would echo that. But he didn't end with that. He said, many understandably pray for a strength they do not possess. But God's promise is somewhat different, that even when strength fails, there is perseverance. And even when perseverance fails, there is hope. And even when hope fails, there is love. And love never fails. You see, he draws this line between the deep despair he's felt in his life and the overwhelming presence of God's love in his life that really raised him from the dead. And as I listened to his sermon, I thought, why in the world would he do this? I mean, here's a respectable guy. He has a position of significance in our culture. He's very articulate. I mean, he's super successful. Why bear it all and share about the darkest moments of your life? I think it's because he knows that God loves him. And, and the reality is this, because of God's love, he has a story to tell that is much more powerful than all the shame he ever felt in his depression. And you see, he wants people to know the love of God. Now, we're in the second week, as I mentioned, on what it means to be a little salty. And last week we learned that we are called the salt of the earth, of the world, because we're to be the flavor of Christ. We're to bring the, the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, into every aspect of our lives, to season our lives with Jesus, because Jesus is our life. And this week we look at, well, how do I speak of faith? How does that become a part of what I say? How do we share our stories? And you know what, in preparation for this, we got to be so honest. Before we look at Scripture, we need to be honest about where we are, because as human beings, I think we've sort of lost the ability to have these conversations, real conversations. Yeah, I know they happen, but they just don't happen that much anymore because they're warring factions that are at work in America, and it seems like every conversation is, is just sort of drawn into that. Each voice wanting to be the loudest, demanding to be heard, and as a result, we've lost the public square, that place where we could listen to the different ideas. And what we've sort of done is we've created a hundred public squares where you can get your own TV channel or you can hear the very things you want to hear in that echo chamber where we're hearing a lot about. And we've even created different neighborhoods. You know, studies have shown in America that, that folks who have different views, they've actually moved away from other people. They don't even have to hear or encounter those stories. And into the middle of this, we learn this isn't the way of Jesus. So how can we respond? Well, we desperately need to create our places in our lives to listen to other people. And that's what Explore God is all about. It's having those conversations. Hey, what do you think? What are your questions? What are the things you're wrestling with? Because what I've come to see is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to another human being. Actually, I think almost more than anything today, it signals that you love them, is to listen to them 
to hear their story without criticism or judgment on your part because, you see, the better you know their story, the better you will know what it means to love that person. Now, you know, Scripture teaches, and we share a lot, that when we come to faith in Christ, we call it the priesthood of the believer, That you don't need a priest. There's nobody between you and God anymore. You can go directly to God in prayer. And that's an amazing thing. Rarely do we talk about, but Scripture also talks about the prophethood of all believers. Yes, because of Jesus and the living hope that you have and the message of his grace, you have this grace to live out and, and share. And by the way, to be a prophet doesn't mean the ability to foretell the future. Well, you say, well, what does a prophet do? What is a prophet? If you're taking notes, you may want to write this down. In the, in the Hebrew way of prop, being a prophet, it included these three things. The first is called nataf, and it literally is a gentle dropping of truth, like the dropping of rain that word is used for, that in your life every day, Jesus is, is a part of your life, And so it's not a downpour, but it's like always a gentle expression of grace in all of your conversation. And then there's what is called masa. Literally, that's the word for burden. And the reason is because we learn that God puts burdens on people, things that we care about. For example, God may have given you a burden for children or education or for the poor, or for immigrants, or a concern for those being trafficked to our city. And you see, God may give you this burden for a season, or he may give it to you for a whole lifetime. And the reason he gives you this burden is because it demonstrates his own love and mission, okay, as we belong to him. And finally, there's what's simply called Navi, Navi. And what it is, is it's just an announcement or proclamation of the truth. You see, most of the time, we probably should be silent, but there are times to speak, and the prophetic word is simply sharing the news, not your opinion, but it's God's announcement. It's a declaration. It's not about your agenda or your program, and, and that is what Paul is doing in this text today, and what I'd like to share with a little with about today I like to look with you at, at, the, at the motive, what's driving his conversation, his attitude in it, and finally, the expression of it. Now, let me tell you what's happened in this long chapter that you heard read to you. Paul grew up in a very, very conservative Jewish home, and because of this, and because he had become, come to faith in Christ, there were a group of f- fanatics in Jerusalem that wanted Paul dead. When Paul was visiting Jerusalem, this group of people created a disturbance, a riot at the temple, claiming that he had walked a Gentile through the temple area, which was a great, would be a great scandal if he did it. He didn't do it, but it didn't matter because they blamed this on him. And a large crowd grew, and they were angry, and they physically attacked Paul, and they would have killed him, but some Roman soldiers showed up and intervened. Instead, the soldiers arrested Paul, filed charges, and he was in custody. Paul had the opportunity to present his case before the Jewish council and before Roman leaders, and along the way, Paul made a very strategic legal move. It was one that would prolong his case for a long time, and he doesn't know at this time, but it's also going to lead to his eventual death. What he did was he appealed as a Roman citizen to the highest court in the land. He appeared for judgment from the emperor himself. And we pick up the story after this appeal has been made. And that means that whatever happens in this moment, that Paul can neither be cleared nor can he be convicted. And you read this story and you're like, okay, if this can't help him, why in the world is he doing this? Why why does he put forth this energy? He has nothing to gain. He can't win points for his trial. And we're beginning to see his motivation. And you sort of think of that, you know, what is your motivation when you speak of faith? 
Now, I, oft, I understand that often when a person comes to faith in Christ, they're convinced of the truth and they feel the desire, and they're often very forceful with their family or their friends. But you see, likely people will read your motivation as louder than your message. And if you have something to prove or you have to be right, it's going to block them being able to see the gospel. Because you see, the gospel is really all about giving away not gaining the upper hand. It's closer to giving a transfusion of blood, like giving life, being willing for it to cost you. Now in this scene, Paul has been brought before a king named Agrippa. And in detail, he relates his background. And, and just like Gerson that I told you about, who preached in the National Cathedral, he shares his story, the unvarnished truth. He says, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus. I caused many believers to be sent to prison and cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. He said, look, I was not a good person. And if you want to begin to focus in on what Paul's heart was like, did you hear that, about that guy Soleimani who was killed? This was Paul. He was willing to chase anyone and pursue the death of anyone who opposed to his views. He was vehemently angry about anyone who would stand against his faith. And so here he is when he's making a case before the king, and he should plead his innocence right up front. He says, hey, I'm the most guilty guy ever. I used to hunt Christians for sport. He is sharing the worst about himself. You say, well, why is he sharing this? Well, later in his message, he explains, Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? And Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am except for these chains. Why share what he has shared when it will gain him nothing? He wants everybody to know Jesus. He wants everybody to experience this freedom from guilt and shame that he has known. Uh, recently, one of our um, Granada members uh, gave me this book. It's entitled Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by a Pakistani whose name is Nabil Qureshi. It's the story of how a devoted Muslim came to faith in Christ. And by the way, he grew up in an amazing home. His parents were really devoted to their faith, to Islam. And the, it, it was a very supportive of him. And he was a very bright guy. He was happily walking with, uh, in his faith. And actually, when he went to college, he was trying to convince a man that he met in college about his own faith, trying to lead him in the direction of Islam. And they were going to have a debate. And before the debate, he went and read the Bible just so that he could argue with this other man. And this man didn't want to argue. He was really willing to walk with him in the direction of Jesus. And he loved Nabil enough to walk in this journey. Now, you should know that it is very costly for Muslims to come to Jesus. They face, often face rejection from their own families. And by the way, it's not a soft rejection. It is, can be painful and punishing. But here was, here was Nabil, and he came to the place where he trusted in Christ. And after coming to faith, though he had a degree from medical school and might have gone into to a medical, uh, the medical profession, Instead, he had that masa, that, that burden, right, for his own people. And he went out and he began to share. It was so amazing, as online I found, you know, he would go to these festivals, Muslim festivals, he'd get a booth, and there he would just talk to people about Jesus. One in Dearborn, Michigan, he was sharing about Jesus when he was arrested. Here he is in, in court, standing to face charges of, of disturbing the peace. Why would he do this? Why face this kind of opposition? He said, we don't have to go overseas to introduce people to Jesus. We can do it by loving our neighbors as ourselves while we love Jesus with all our hearts and minds. You see, it's born of love. We've experienced such a grace and love from God. It's like, we want other people to know him. <laughs> and I know you probably think, well, I don't know how to talk about Jesus. How do you do that? 
Well, first it just becomes with, well, I, want to, I, I love people, and I want them to have this life in Christ. You see, it's not about learning how to do it well. It's about loving people well. Love for Jesus and for others are the reasons that we would be willing to do this. Now, here's the amazing thing about this moment for Paul. It is all set up to intimidate him, to frighten him. It wasn't just a private audience. This is what we're told. Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. So here is the highest authority in the area, the king, no doubt dressed in purple, showing his authority and rule, and then the military brass are there. The word in, in, the, in their language literally means commanders of thousands. That's who's seated there. All the nobility of Palestine are there, and the governor is there. We know that, the leading politicians. Paul is nobody to these people. It would have been a frightening scene. Yet here's Paul's attitude. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today. You're like, wow, he's not afraid? They could squash him like a bug. He's grateful. He's having the time of his life. They think they can scare him. But he knows this is an amazing opportunity. He gets to share Jesus with them. And this is what drives his attitude. Every step of the way, we see the boldness of his willingness to speak the truth about Jesus. And by the way, you know how the Romans viewed this? Jesus was a criminal who had been convicted and executed. And he, this guy changed Paul's life and he's following him? So why would he have this boldness? It's not because Paul thinks he's the best speaker around. It's not because he even knows how they will respond. It is the gospel at work in him. He is fearless because he knows he's loved by God no matter what. He's not going to be afraid. He has confidence in what God can do in people's lives. And this is the source of his boldness. We have nothing to prove. It's God alone who changes people's hearts. But, but we do have a story to tell. Um, this year, we have a bunch of people around the United States who pray for us regularly, and I usually write them a letter once every month or two just to tell them what's happening here. And the letter that I wrote for Christmas told about an experience I had when I was a graduate student in Scotland. I went to the University of Edinburgh, and over the winter break, you'll see it in winter here, I think. There we go. In winter, they kicked us out of the dormitory I was living in, and they gave me a new roommate who was from Taiwan. His name was Jun Yi. And Jun Yi had never heard the story about Jesus. And on Christmas Eve, I invited him to go to the Christmas Eve service with me. And that's what it looked like in Edinburgh that night. There had been a heavy snow. And uh, so we're walking across, and I'm telling him about Jesus, about how Jesus was born, and about his miracles, and the things that Jesus had done. And somewhere along, and by the way, this is what Jun Yi told me. He said, you his master had told him before leaving Taiwan, you must learn about Jesus, the Western Buddha. And so I shared him everything about Jesus. And as we're walking across the center of Edinburgh, his interest grew greater and greater. And finally he said, what happened to this man? And so I shared about the arrest and the beating and crucifixion of Jesus. And as we're walking, I mean, it's the most amazing thing. I can still hear the sound of the snow cracking under my feet, I began to hear this little quiet crying of this Asian man who had become my friend. Here was a God moment. You know, I just told him the story of Jesus, and God was working in his heart. God showed this intersection of this man who was so beautiful, he, he couldn't imagine that anybody would mistreat him. Here was God working. You see, we can be bold because we know it's up to God. He does this. It's, it's all of him. We don't make it happen. And we've received this grace ourselves. We are confident in God. But there's also, as you read this deep humility of Paul, here's what I didn't tell you about this King Agrippa. He is the last of the Herod dynasty. His great-grandfather is Herod the Great, and he was the one who killed the babies in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. Think about that. His great uncle is the one who murdered John the Baptist. His father had James, the first Christian martyr, killed. And he also had Peter thrown in prison. Add to this one other factor. Bernice is mentioned. 
That's actually Agrippa's sister, younger by a year. But you know what's happening at this point in time? He's living with her like his wife in an incestuous relationship. Can you imagine living in a sexual marriage kind of relationship with your sister? This is what Agrippa is doing. But there's no sign of disrespect. There's no sign. That there's, the only thing there is in Paul is, is humility and respect for this man. And you're like, oh, my goodness. Look at the heart of Paul in all of this. It's an amazing picture that we're seeing. Here is this respect and humility and courage. It's the heart of why we share what we, we share. And, and, I, and so I ask the question, what is your attitude toward other people? This was a desperately lost couple. And by the way, that, that hung as a shadow over Bernice's life for the rest of her life that she had done that. But Paul doesn't see himself as better than they are. He knows what has happened in his life is all of grace. You see, this is the way it works. If your attitude doesn't reflect the gospel, your, your message won't be able to carry the gospel. Paul can be this way because he knows he's saved by grace. Basically, you could say his whole message here to Agrippa is this, I shouldn't be loved by Jesus, but I am. It's a miracle. And this is why the message is hopeful. He knows they can be saved because he's been saved. He shouldn't be there. And you know that's true about us? If you are not humble, you don't see the truth of your own story that you shouldn't be redeemed by God. And by the way, you may say, oh, well, I grew up in church. That, of course, I, I should know God. Look, I grew up in church too, and I saw such stuff that I, it made me want to have nothing to do with the church. We're a mess. The fact that I am here is a miracle. It's a gift of God's grace. It's because God has loved me, and I, I have no other explanation than that. It's not about deserving it is about the love of God that is strong enough to tame a rebel's heart, strong enough to penetrate an arrogant mind, strong enough to overcome a willful self. You see, none of us should be here right now, but we are. And if we judge others, we're saying, I, I don't believe I'm actually saved by grace. Well, you see, that's the only way we can be saved. We'd be without hope if Jesus didn't come on our behalf. So we can show that we ourselves don't believe the gospel by the attitude we have toward others. So, so how do you look at other people? How do you see other people that you just think, wow, they're so lost, or, or that couple or person in such trouble? And you see, the gospel gives us such hope for everyone because we can be honest about ourselves and our own need. It gives us courage to share and respect for other people, no matter who they are. And, and, and from here, Paul just goes to his own defense. And by the way, that word there is the word that we get the word apologia, apology. It's the source word for apologetics, a defense of the faith. So you say, okay, how do we defend the faith? What does that look like? And I want to share with you what I would call is the turn in his story when his life completely changes. One day I was on such a mission to kill Christians to Damascus, and about noon, your majesty, I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions, and we all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked, and the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. This is the core of Paul's story, the miracle that Paul, the one killing Christians, the one persecuting Jesus experiences, and, and this is what he does. It's his own personal story. There are no finely crafted arguments here. There's no philosophical hat tricks. No, there is only his firsthand encounter with Jesus, the Son of God. Now, I know a few among us may learn no, know how to explain the faith to everybody, like Ravi Zacharias. I hope you'll go and see him. Some may be able to debate the faith with anybody, but all of us have a story to tell. You see, the Jesus people need to see is the Jesus alive at work in the life of a real person, a person like you. A person like you living in the same neighborhood, going to the same school, struggling with the same challenges and temptations, living with the same fears and brokenness and doubt that everybody knows. But you see, but there's Jesus in your life. 
the living Christ, and they will see him loving you, giving you joy and freedom, giving you life. You see, that's what you have to share. And you say, why your story? Because actually your story is an episode in the life of Jesus himself. In 2006, Larry King did something really interesting. I don't know if you remember Larry King. Here's a picture of him from his talk show called Larry King Live. He was one of the really great TV interviewers and radio interviewers. He interviewed some of the most famous people in the world. And one night in 2006, he decided to go into San Quentin Prison. Why were there some of the worst people on earth <laughs> are in this prison? And by the way, he did spend an hour going to talk to the victims families of the five men that he talked to. There was one Hispanic, two African-American, and two black men. And you say, well, why was he there? What was he doing in prison? Well, those men had been carefully chosen because everybody around them said, something has changed these guys' lives. They've learned, they've grown, they've educated themselves. They are not the same. Every single one of them had confessed to their crime. Every single one of them had murdered somebody. But something was surprising about this evening with those men. Every single one of them had turned their lives over to Jesus Christ. Each one brought this up. And by the way, Larry did his best to try and change the subject to something else. Yeah, yeah, but what did you learn? Or, or yeah, but how did this happen? And one of those guys named Julius, for example, answered like this. Larry said, what have you learned? He responded, faith, God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I surrendered my life to him. He taught me how to love. He allows me to know that I can love other people. The Bible says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I live my life for the Lord Jesus Christ now. Sort of hard to change that subject, right? <laughs> There's nobody beyond the reach of God's grace. And that was the message of their stories. And this is the gospel. Everyone needs grace. <laughs> And here's what Jesus told Paul. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me. Don't you love that? He says, tell people you've seen me. Tell people what has happened, that I am alive. And that is what happens. Our personal stories become the way that people can see the living Christ. Your life is meant to be a window God opens so that people can see Jesus, that he's a real, that he's alive. And likely, by the way, I read this story and I think Paul would have never thought himself qualified to do this because he knew his own past. He knew he was worthy of none of this. And so what it's really about is saying, wow, Jesus has come into my life and has made all the difference in the world. And it made me sort of hear the words of Jesus. Now get to your feet. I have appeared to you. Now go and share with somebody about that. Tell somebody. Father, we are so stuck in a moment in time. And, and I read this passage and I think, can, can we get to another time? Can there be another place where we can really sit and share our stories and listen to the stories of others. Lord, thank you for Donatella and that she had courage to share her story with us today. Then in a culture which is so easy to be shamed by other people, the power of your love at work in her life overcame all of that because she knows she's loved by you, Lord. And Father, I pray that that would enable us Father, we know most of the time we, we should listen and be silent. And that's really a good way to love. Teach us how to do that, Lord. Help, help us to ask people, invite people to share their stories with us. And then, Lord, when the time comes, enable us just to, to be able to share the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. And, Lord, as we look at other people, give us an attitude that remembers that it's a miracle that any of us have your love. We know that none of us have come to you because we could put it all together and, and do everything well. We know that you're the God who has come to us through Jesus. And you've loved us despite the mess that each one of us are. And your love has been greater than all of our doubts and fears and 
And Lord, a past, a lot of it we, we don't want anybody to know about. You know it all and you've loved us anyway. And so, Lord, I pray that our attitude toward others would be in the light of that. And we thank you, O Lord, and we pray that you'll lead us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.